Mali to get things right. We're doing our best to, to really create an authentic project about Alaska Native people for children's educational television values with the world. You're watching New England Public Media, WGBY Springfield. Just as soon as I see the black church has been the root of the most celebrated aspects of black culture. Gospel music is about the majesty of Jesus. It sets the tone for how you will feel when the word comes forth. It's such a distinct flavor of music. It's something about those songs that brings joy. The Black Church. The Story of the Black Church, February 16th on NEPM. Coming up, stories we're connecting you with tonight. Last week's presidential inauguration was unlike any other in history, and we'll take a look at it through the lens of a photojournalist. What he said resonated with me concerning immigrants. They're not seen, they're in a sense missing from our society, hence the missing stars on the flag. Two people from different continents come together to honor the death of a local World War II veteran. Jean's assassination was witnessed by residents in Lobbenheim, and in the years following the war, they haven't forgotten. And Massachusetts moves closer to a new state seal. The symbols of the past are not always uh, accurate representations of the present, and we need to have conversations about those. Details on those stories and more up next on Connecting Point. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. Good evening, and thanks for joining us for Connecting Point. I'm Saivalis Bauer. The inauguration of President Joe Biden happened amid a pandemic and against the backdrop of a violent siege on the U.S. Capitol building a week beforehand. As a result, the swearing-in of America's new commander-in-chief was unlike any other in history. New England public media correspondent, photojournalist Barry Goldstein, was on the ground in the Capitol to capture the mood leading up to and during the inauguration. The result is Divided, Scenes from Inauguration 2021, a Connecting Point digital exclusive series available online now at NEPM.org. Through documentary, photography, portraiture, and interviews, Goldstein conveys the sense of uncertainty and division surrounding one of the most important traditions in our republic. He spoke with me recently about the experience. Well, Zydalis, this was, uh, let's see, my third inauguration that uh, I've covered. And uh, of course, it was very, very different from the previous ones, which um, featured crowds, very festive. First off, the Capitol was surrounded by the so-called green zone with a buffer of perhaps a half a mile or so, completely surrounding the Capitol, the mall, the government buildings. There were relatively few people on the streets. There really wasn't much to see other than a lot of young National Guards troops. From the images that you captured, the crowds that gathered seemed overwhelmingly in favor of President Biden. Did you encounter any supporters of former President Trump while you were there? Uh, I did once in uh, three days. Um, I saw a group of people unmasked uh, who looked like uh, tourists. Um, uh, group of burly men with uh, high and tight haircuts. Uh, and uh, I did stop and ask them if they were um, here for the inauguration and they said yes. I asked if they would like to uh, be photographed and interviewed and they asked by who and I said, uh, New England Public Media and they said, definitely not. <laughs> and continued on their way. So. Um, I'll make the assumption that uh, they were not uh, Biden supporters. So, um, but other than that, uh, didn't see uh, anyone who was an overt uh, Trump supporter. And, and I, and I think every other journalist there looked hard because of course we wanna try to get as many points of view as we can. 
Now let's talk about the photos as you just mentioned, because one of the ones that was striking to me was the Mexican artist Roberto Marquez, who had a piece of artwork that resembled a flag but was missing some stars. And it was for him a commentary on immigration. And he wanted to make people think about there's things that are lacking. And I think that probably resonates with many of us. Um, do you have any favorite images from the ones that you captured during the inauguration? Visually, the one of Roberto is, is a favorite of mine. What he said resonated with me concerning immigrants, how the presence of immigrants uh, here in the U.S., uh, they're often invisible, they're not seen, they're in a sense missing from our society, hence the missing stars on the flag. In terms of uh, other favorite images, this is a series of three images. These images sort of um, personify the whole experience of being an American and, and what it's like. So a lot of people on the interviews talk about the military presence in D.C. and the sort of threatening atmosphere. And in fact, I lit this photo to sort of emphasize that. When I first got there and started talking to the soldiers, I noticed two things. Most of the soldiers did not have weapons. In fact, I photographed these two because they did, and uh, that was fairly unusual. And they were very happy to, uh, to speak with me. They weren't allowed to say very much. Um, they could tell me what state they were from, but that was pretty much it. This is the performance artist, Crackhead Barney, holding a dead rat that she picked up on the street. I like it. It's uh, very colorful and is probably the antithesis of what most people would think of uh, regarding a photojournalist's inauguration coverage. The next image is uh, her doing her thing, and she's confronting these young guards people at one of the Green Zone sites. A couple of points about this. Uh, this, not so much this image, but this experience really personified to me what this inauguration was about and what living in this country is about. You have these rather threatening looking soldiers at, at first a glimpse, but on second view, they're not armed. They're very young. They're, of course, all masked. And there's this very strange person who's decided to confront them about a, a number of issues. So guys, where were all of you guys? January 6th, Capitol! Not a bad question, uh, albeit posed by a, an unusual person. So that's part of what being in America is about, the ability to, to confront authority literally in their faces. Secondly, the soldiers uh, took it. They stood there. Um, you can see this uh, young woman is <laughs> surprised and trying hard to maintain her composure. But at no time did they um, adopt a threatening posture. They simply stood there. And then, of course, the third part of, <laughs> of all this is that there's a slew of other photographers and journalists surrounding them recording all of this. And that's the third part of living in this country, that we're free to, to do that. So while you were at the inauguration, you had the opportunity to meet and speak with other journalists from around the world. With their perspective looking from the outside in, what were your thoughts about some of their comments and observations? They really offered some very interesting and fascinating um, views. Um, some of them a bit more optimistic than uh, I expected, and a few somewhat pessimistic. For example, uh, Sarah Baxter uh, and her photographer uh, husband, Jez Coulson, who've worked in a number of war zones, Gaza, Bosnia, remarked about how D.C. looked uh, somewhat uh, like a war zone and how off-putting that was. But when asked about their take on the events of January 6th and their uh, expectations for the future, Sarah 
You mentioned that the checks and balances were challenged, but that they held. And I think in her words, she says, America is still America. May God bless America and may God protect our troops. Thank you, America. And you can see the images and interviews that Barry Goldstein captured at the inauguration in our digital exclusive series, Divided, Scenes from Inauguration 2021, available online right now at nepm.org slash connecting point. Since his death in 1944, Pittsfield native Eugene Kalinowski has been known as one of thousands who made the ultimate sacrifice during World War II. The story of a plane crash and his subsequent death has been passed down through the surviving members of his family. But recently, it was discovered that the last moments of Kalinowski's life were far different than both his country and his family had been led to believe. Connecting Point's Ross Lipman tells us the true story of his final mission and how it's brought together two people wanting to keep his memory alive. <laughs> this cold makes my eyes water. Every December, just before the holidays, Carol Brooks comes to the Pittsfield Cemetery. Just over there by the trees. Oh, the funeral's going on. To decorate the graves of family she's lost. Well, when you lose a child, it's very difficult. Some gone much too young, like her daughter, Kristen. She was four and a half, but she ended up having a heart attack. Then there's her grandfather, Vasily Kalinowski. He was a good grandfather, very close with us. Carol could spend all day. My father, my mother. In the cold. She was a, a wonderful mom, wonderful. My sister Anne, she was six years older than myself. Telling stories about each person. They're at peace, that's the, that's the main thing. But today she's here to visit a relative she didn't know. Just always thought of him as being our uncle that was killed in the plane crash. His story. Three, two, one. The story of what really happened to Army Air Force Staff Sergeant Eugene Kalinowski. Maybe the greatest story she can tell. He was only 24 when he died. On October 15, 1944, Gene was on his 50th and final mission when his plane was shot down by Nazi German forces. Initial reports said that of the 10-man crew, two died while evacuating the plane, including Kalinowski. For years, the belief in the story had been that the plane was shot down and that's how he died, correct? Right. That's how I understood it. You know, that's how I was always told. I think that's how they thought of it, too. But Gene, in fact, survived the landing and was discovered by SS soldiers near the German village of Lobbenheim. Carol only learned of how her uncle truly died just a few years ago. After he had landed and they were taking him to a, some type of a holding place, um, he, um, he was shot by a, a German soldier, an SS soldier. So he dies serving during World War II. Right. The story for, for years and years and years is that the plane was shot down, the plane crashes, he dies during the plane crash. Yeah. And then you find out that an SS officer, in fact, killed your uncle. What was that immediate sort of gut feeling you had? I couldn't really believe it. I didn't know if it really it was true. It was true. Gene's assassination was witnessed by residents in Lobbenheim, and in the years following the war, they haven't forgotten, including this past fall, 76 years later, when Carol learned of plans to create a memorial for Gene. The memorial is to commemorate right. what happened to your uncle. It was going to be my uncle's 100th birthday and it was the 75th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. It was around the same time that Carol learned the truth behind Jean's death that she was contacted by someone in Germany. His name is Joachim Hennig. He wanted to learn more about Jean's life and make sure the real story was known. And just as Joachim found Carol... You want to tap that to turn your camera on. We wanted to find him. Hi. Hi. Today's the day, huh? Today's the day. 
and give to people who aren't so used to Zoom or video chatting. He'll turn his camera on in a minute. A chance to meet face to face. There he is. Joachim. Yeah, hello. Hello. Nice to meet you. Well, I, I take it you two know each other. Joachim, Carol, Carol, Joachim. We haven't seen us. Uh, no, no. Life. Not live. It's nice to see a face that I've been been talking to uh, for a while. How long have the two of you been emailing with each other before today? Since 2016. I told him I was a baby when my uncle left for Germany and that he had taken my baby shoes and put them around his neck for good luck. So I've always kind of felt a bond to him that way. And this was a uh, luck for me to become the contact to Carol and the family so that it will be al alive and uh, actually. You think that it is important that this story live on, correct? I think it's uh, very important. Uh, because uh, we must learn from our history, learning for the future from the past. And we must learn what had happened and that this never may happen again. I look forward to seeing how your relationship grows from here as well. I think it's very exciting. Like I said, I have friends, I have a friend in Germany <laughs> me too, me too. Right. And the whole there. family too. The whole family too. The whole family, all oh, okay. And you can see and learn more of Eugene Kalinowski's story in a digital extra available online at nepm.org slash connecting point. Massachusetts lawmakers have passed a bill that takes a big step toward changing the state's official seal and model. This comes after years of concerns from Native American residents, as the current seal shows a hand holding a sword over the head of a Native American. The new bill creates a commission to review and recommend changes to the state seal and motto. And Connecting Point's Ray Herschel talked to the bill sponsor in the House, Northampton State Representative Lindsay Sabadosa, about why she feels a change to the state seal is long overdue. This legislation has been proposed for many, many years. So really we're, you know, coming up on the, the tail end of 30 years that people have been com having conversations about this bill. And so I was very grateful that all that groundwork had been laid. It made it much easier to talk to colleagues. Um, but honestly, we had a lot of support from House leadership. We had great conversations, both with Speaker DeLeo and then with Speaker Mariano. And we had a chairman of House Ways and Means who really understood the legislation from day one. Um, we had organized a call with him to try to convince him to support it. And he started that call off saying that, you know, he just really understood it, that the, the symbols of the past are not always uh, accurate representations of the present. And we need to have conversations about those. Um, we also had a really committed chairwoman, uh, Chairwoman Gregoire from uh, the State Administration and Oversight Committee, and she was great along the way. She kept directing us to new people to talk to, and in the end, we spoke to over 100 legislators on the House side and made sure that they understood the bill and that we had their support, and we were able to pass it pretty much at the very last minute. I think it was either the very last or the second to last pieces of legislation that passed on January 5th, at, uh, or January 6th rather, at about 5 a.m. Uh, the state seal, uh, as it currently existed, showed a sword hanging over the head of a Native American with the motto, by the sword we sh seek peace, uh, but peace uh, only under liberty. Uh, why was this so offensive to so many? Right. Well, the sword that was depicted on the, or that is currently depicted on the state seal and flag is a sword that was used to behead one of the native leaders. The image of the native person on our flag is a sort of Frankenstein version of what the artist deemed the best and best representation of what a native should look like. Um, so I think that by today's standards, we can all agree that there are probably better symbols that could represent the state of Massachusetts. And this legislation will 
seek to put together a committee, a commission that will look at what our flag currently looks like, what our, our motto looks like. Um, we can look at the many examples we've had in the past because this is not the only seal Massachusetts has ever had. In fact, in the State House, you see a long history of various seals that have represented the Commonwealth at one point or another. Um, and they'll try to see, you know, what should we do going forward? And I think we're at a really interesting moment because we are also following the example of another state. Mississippi very recently changed its state flag. They went through this process. They put together a commission and they eventually went to the ballot to ask the voters what their flag should look like. Now, I don't know if Massachusetts will go through that process, but it would be interesting to have a, a really in-depth and robust conversation about this, particularly as we hit some important anniversaries. And last year was the anniversary, the 400th anniversary of the uh, Plymouth Colony. And in 10 years, we'll be looking at the 400th anniversary of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and the founding of the General Court. So it is a really good time to have these conversations. And I'm excited that so many people were, um, were eager to do that. And we're going to see this commission formed and hopefully have some recommendations for us uh, towards the end of the year. And uh, who specifically will be sitting on this commission? And as I understand it, then the, the commission itself won't necessarily recommend a new seal. That may be up for further discussion and even the public having input. Exactly. So the commission is not going to just come out and say, this is what the flag should look like. We're, we're going to ask for input. People will be on the commission from uh, different state agencies. So the Mass Historical Society, the Office of the Secretary of State, there will be appointees by the speaker, the governor, the attorney general. But really, as we were crafting the legislation and trying to decide who should be on the commission, we wanted to make sure that there were a lot of native voices. Massachusetts has a deep history of, of native Americans um, not really getting their say in our in our government and not really acknowledging that these were native lands Plymouth colony was founded on native lands there were indigenous people living here and so we wanted to make sure that all of those people had a seat at the table moving forward so that we can come up with something that represents our history our culture and the values that we want to represent us moving forward The Commonwealth of Massachusetts has so many rivers that the state's Wikipedia page is still putting together the list. For visitors, these waterways are nice to look at, but for the people who live in the towns in which these rivers flow, they can be the most important bodies of water in their world. Connecting Point's Brian Sullivan traveled to the Franklin County towns of Ashfield and Conway to take a look at the South River to find out where it's been and where it's going. The Roadside River is one of the more common sites here in Massachusetts. While the Charles and Connecticut may carry the name recognition, there are so many others scattered throughout the state that the list is still being compiled. When mills were at their height of prominence, many waterways were simply referred to as the Mill River. Those mills then changed the natural flow of those rivers to better suit their industrial needs. After the mills closed, those changes then opened the door to potential havoc if the rivers took on an inordinate amount of water as the result of a heavy storm. For instance, in 2011, the South River flooded out the downtown area of Conway when Hurricane Irene touched down. Since then, this riprap retaining wall has been installed. But watershed organizations and environmental groups would like to see more projects that restore the river's natural meandering pattern and wide berth in order to avoid future catastrophes. When you see these changes in the landscape over time, you see the changes in the river system, and the river system becomes more unstable. So if you get a heavy rain event like Tropical Storm Irene, the river doesn't have the, the room that it needs um, to accommodate that rainfall. And so what you end up with is erosion, you end up with flooding, you end up with, um, again, roads and businesses and infrastructure that are, are threatened by this. So what we're trying to do with this work is recreate the natural system that over hundreds of years has been really disrupted. In a major step to mitigate that disruption, only a stone's throw from Conway Center where so much damage had been done in 2011, the Franklin Regional Council of Governments partnered with the Friends of the South River and others to do a river restoration project at the South River Meadow. It's an 11-acre plot of land where people can come to walk, 
do some bird watching, or even just have a seat to watch and listen as the river curves around the property and continues along the roadway. The South River Meadow in Conway is a prime example of a river restoration project gone right. Now this area in particular where the grade drops down a couple of feet from the rest of the field and continues to slope toward the water comes in pretty handy in the springtime when all this snow and ice melts off. We are very proud of it. Uh, it has been restored all along the edges. The invasive plants have been removed, which is huge. It's a demonstration uh, project in, in process for what people can do with their own land. And uh, in particular, because this was the town land, this was where we were able to do the first major project. That point of pride carried a price tag in the $300,000 range. And as was mentioned, they would like this project to demonstrate to private landowners along Route 116 from Ashfield to Conway, something they themselves may consider doing to protect their property. But as with everything, getting this work done comes down to dollars and cents. They're too expensive to do all at once in one big chunk. And so that's why, you know, the, they're, and they're difficult problems. And that's why they don't get done and they don't get done. And we're all still in danger. But all of that piecemeal work, if done, could still be undone in the event of a breach of the dam at the Ashfield Lake. And no, this porous spillway is not the last line of defense. It's this earthen dam, which, when originally constructed, was ahead of its time. But now, to keep up with the times, it will need an additional foot in height, a project that will cost over a million dollars. And that price tag is likely too steep for the local river groups to raise themselves. But if they really want to protect the 17-mile stretch of river that connects the two towns, it all starts here. In a perfect scenario, the state would come in like they did in 1990 and do all the restoration themselves. But in today's climate of sharing costs, I imagine that we'll be responsible for 10 to 25 percent of the cost of the rehab. That does it for Connecting Point for January 29th, 2021. Remember, you can always find the stories that you saw tonight, as well as exclusive features, digital-only content, and more online anytime at nepm.org slash connecting point. And please join us again next Friday night at 6, right here on New England Public Media, for more stories of the people, places, and ideas that matter most to Western New England. I'm Saidalis Bauer. Be safe and have a good night. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. On American Experience. Marian Anderson challenged people's ideas of what the souls of black folk looked and sounded like. She is willing to show up because she is not going to accept racial oppression.